It starts by asking someone if they're thinking about suicide and not to be afraid to ask the question. Because if we ask the question, it, people it's a myth. People think you're putting something in their head. It's quite the opposite. Welcome back to another episode of That's an Issue. And this topic is probably one of the most important topics we discuss on That's an Issue. It's definitely a conversation that it's very heavy. So just giving you a warning, trigger warning. And if you're younger, perhaps you should ask a parent or guardian if you should be listening to it. But we talk to store cats, the classics talk to store cats about suicide and w how to help the people that are going through it and what are the proper steps the questions that are on your mind are asked in this week's episode and i personally learned a lot you will hear about our friends at relief here is this week's episode Mental health, relationships, those are loaded topics and something that affects every part of our lives. But we aren't having enough open conversations about it. And that's an issue. Welcome, Stuart Katz. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, giving us your limited time in New York. We appreciate it. If you could start, just tell us a little bit about what you do, how you're involved in the mental health space. So I'm actually not in the mental health space. Um, I got involved five years ago when our youngest daughter was doing her national service in Israel. And um, she was part of the Bat Ami program, um, which is they send kids abroad um, to represent Israel um, in the diaspora. Um, and she was sent to Houston. And about six weeks into the year, she told us that she had to come home. Um, we had this is a kid that's traveled the world. Um, she could tell you exactly how many countries she's been in, but it's somewhere over 40. Wow. And um, I'm in the travel business, so that's why. Mm. It's not like... Okay. Um, and uh, we wasn't the type to get homesick, and we wondered what was going on. And ultimately, her siblings convinced us that she should come home, um, along with people from the program, even though they were reluctant at first because they said she was like one of their top candidates and she, her profile just fit that she has to be abroad. But after they realized that something was wrong and she had to come home. So she came home and she got what's called another tech-in, which is um, an assignment in a hospital in Tel Aviv, working with a lot of children, mainly, mainly from Gaza. Um, and uh, continued her year. Um, as a child, she probably would not want me saying this, did very, very well in high school. Um, uh, and at one of the top high schools in Yerushalayim. And um, she just began, we began to see her slide um, when she was at the hospital. She didn't want to get up every day. Um, again, a kid that was a Madrichan B'nai Akiva, couldn't, couldn't wait to do more. And all of a sudden we saw her sliding. So she finished the year and the sub subsequent year she was toying between going to university, going to um, um, the Midrashah program. And ultimately she decided to work at a uh, kindergarten in Modin. We live in Hashmonaim, so a couple kilometers away. And um, she did, but really, really struggled. And we began to see her really struggling, just couldn't get out of, couldn't get out of bed, had no motivation. Um, friends would come over, she wouldn't want to see them. They'd go up to her room and just sit with her while she was in bed. Um, they were, their friends were amazing. Um, and, you know, we went through the year and it just began to get real bad. And, um, it was on March the 5th, um, about five years ago. Um, I had just landed at JFK and my wife calls me and she says that she's running to pick her up because she swallowed pills. Um, swallowed pills in front of her psychologist. Again, I didn't really know anything, um, but to me it seemed a little weird that you would do that. So that was kind of a red flag to me. And the bigger red flag is he called my wife to come pick her up. Um, I don't have a lot of medical background, um, but I would call 911 right. or Hatsala or, you know, I wouldn't call the parent to come get them, but what do I know? Or what did I know? Um, so my wife came and got her. She went to the hospital and um, 
it was not a pleasant experience. Um, uh, the hospitals in Israel, um, I'll be blunt, people don't like when I say it, and I don't like saying it, but they're horrendous when it comes to suicidality and mental health. And people are shocked when I say Israel's known to be top of the medical world, um, the world over. And my response is when it comes to mental health, they're at the bottom. Um, last year alone, I visited 22 different countries to understand mental health on a global perspective. And um, I'm embarrassed to say that there are many countries in Africa, in Latin America, um, that the mental health is substantially better than in Israel. And people are shocked when wow. I say that. Yeah, and that I, say, I say, Israel, when they decide that mental health is going to be a priority, and I think we're like on the Arab of them deciding, I don't know if Arab means a year, five years, or 10 years, but we're getting there. When they make that decision, Israel's going to be number one in the world. Um, when but don't they deal with a lot of PTSD with their soldiers? So everything trauma related is PTSD. They, they, there's no okay. trauma so in Israel, it's all PTSD, which as a psychology studio, that's not the case. Right. Um, most most trauma spends, will stem from childhood, um, from, even from infancy. Um, and, um, you know, Bessel van der Kolk says it best, the body keeps the score. And um, as I've gotten more into it myself, I can, I start recognizing my own traumas from childhood, but it doesn't really matter what took place. It's recognizing that it's there and accepting it. Um, but that's, probably for another podcast. <laughs> right, um, right. But, but anyways. Um, so what happened after? Uh, you really want to hear. <laughs> um, yeah. So what happened was is um, we then went to her psychiatrist um, who had, she had been seeing and was on medication. And the other thing in Israel, um, which is very common, it's common the world over, except in the third world where they can't afford medication. Um, they just overdose here, it, you know, in Israel. It's like, if 100 grams doesn't work, let's go to 200. If 200 doesn't work, let's go to 300. Instead of going from 100 and let's go down to 75 or 50, it's, well, we gotta go up because, you know, if it's not working, we gotta give you more. Um, and it's the famous cocktail story, you know, we gotta find the right cocktail. So, okay, well, this drug's not working, let's start another one, but do we take off of this one? No, not necessarily. Um, and then there's some psychiatrists that feel, okay, we gotta make some changes. So they cut you cold off of, you know, and then you have withdrawal. Um, so what happened was, is we went to her psychiatrist and she basically said, if you want to keep her alive, there's nothing in Israel. Wow. And um, talking about stabbing us in the back, you know, this is what we made Aliyah for. And um, we didn't know what to do, but we said, we don't have a choice. Of course we want her alive. And she goes, oh, and by the way, I said, well, what do you recommend? And she recommends this program in Boston. And I said, okay, we're going. Uh, we don't have a US health insurance, but we'll have to pay out of pocket. She goes, well, it's $50,000 a month. A month? A month. Yeah. And I said, um, well, I won't tell you what I said. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, we begged, borrowed, and perhaps stole, um, but we're going to Boston. And that doesn't include the travel expenses right. and the fact that we have to be in a hotel with her and our food and um, you know everything else. And um, so we got into this program in Boston, it's called at McLean Hospital, which is probably the number one psychiatric hospital in the world. It's a good thing we were there for what took place with me, is we walk in and there's other Israeli girls there, nine bed unit, there were other Israeli girls and I, forgive the word because it's not politically correct. I went berserk in a psychiatric hospital. And I said to my wife that, you know, you stay here with her. I gotta go back to Israel and figure out what's going on. I mean, the country is messed up if- If, if people are coming to Boston. People are coming paying $50,000 a month that none of us have that money. Um, we always thought day school tuition in the States was expensive. Right. <laughs> it's nothing, like, it's nothing. A 50K a month will drown you. And. The sad thing is, or perhaps, I don't know if it's sad, I have to think about that, but is while she was there in this program, we felt that every penny was worth it. We saw where the money was going, um, which gave us a good yeah, feeling. That's amazing. But, but the fact that it has to cost that money was, again, insane. Um, so I went back to Israel. Um, when I say I went back, I was going back and forth, but I was determined to find out really what was going on in Israel. 
And I went back and started to meet with organizations and literally, I mean, I, I played Dr. Google. I went on everything, anything, anything, anything with the word mental in Israel, I would try to set up a meeting. Most of them didn't want to meet me because I'm not a doctor. I'm not a rabbi. Mm -hmm. I'm just Joe Schmo. Mm -hmm. And um, why should they meet with me? So finally, one organization agreed to meet. They said, come in and meet with our director. And they actually deal with um, families of victims of suicide. And I went in and I said, yeah, he goes, well, everyone else will be here in a minute. And I said, like, I was afraid you guys were going to tell me that tonight that everyone else is coming. And they, they said, I have this, um, and they said, okay, you can start. What, what, what's your story? I said, what do you mean? I came to meet you guys to find out about Israel. Well, tell us your story. At the time, I didn't have permission to share my daughter's story. Right. And um, I did it anyways. Um, because at, the, at that point, by the time I was able to get this meeting, she had not only been at McLean for four months, she had been in a couple other hospitals, um, you know, because the idea is just to move on. Um, and uh, they were actually not as good. In fact, far, inf far quite inferior. Um, and then she went on a wilderness program. Um, um, if you're familiar with the concept of going out into the in the wild and uh, you know, can't, most of them are in Utah and Colorado and Arizona. Well, we weren't doing that. We went out to Hawaii um, and uh, a horrific experience. I mean, what, what can be bad about Hawaii? Well, wilderness programs in Hawaii can be bad. Um, fortunately, that program has been shut down, so I won't even oh, mention it. Okay. Um, and, you know, we, so I went and told them this and in the room, I'll never forget it. There were 13 people sitting there um, these are psychiatrists, psychologists, principals, business people, um, and they all lost someone to suicide. And they looked at me and said, we wish someone told us about Boston. And I, I got the shivers. I said, okay, I know every penny we spent there was worth it. And there's no guarantee about anything, but I knew that, okay, I found people that I care and that I can work with. And that's really where my journey tans a long answer to your short mm -hmm. question um how it started um in the whole mental health advocacy and um pretty much the past five years that's what i've been doing um so that's amazing you, yeah that's right, crazy that you took your personal experience and turned it into being an advocate like turning that's turning <laughs> not turned turning <laughs> turning yeah, well. yeah so what since then what have you accomplished from that meeting what have what steps and uh, events took place. So, I, I mean, there's a lot that doesn't really have to do with, well, it has to do mm -hmm. with suicidality, but not uh, a little off topic. One of the things is um, for my own mental health and self-care, as they say, I didn't know what that meant before. I thought self-care was showering in the morning. Or right. If you're perhaps OCD or, you know, um, if um, in the afternoon as well. But um, I, um, I, I tried to, learn as much as I could. And I took this course called Mental Health First Aid. Um, and um, I hadn't been in school in 30 years at the time, maybe longer. And I was fascinated with it. I thought it was like, first of all, I aced it. It was so easy. It was common sense, but it made so much sense. And I, um, I said, I got to bring this to Israel. So I came back to Israel. I went to Ministry of Health and different, uh, if you're familiar with the healthcare system in Israel, the Kupot, you know, Maccabi, Muhadet, and uh, Klal, I, I tried I to. No oh, idea. It's socialized medicine, <laughs> yeah. so there's it's different funds, like they're HMOs basically. Mm -hmm. I went to talk to them, and e everywhere I went in Israel, they thought I wanted money, and mm. I didn't know how I was going to fund this. I didn't want their money; I just wanted their blessing. And they said, "Oh, it sounds like a good idea." So none of them signed on right away, and um, I was determined to bring mental health first aid to Israel. Um, mental health first aid is very like franchise oriented by country. So I cannot teach the US course in Israel. The US mm -hmm. course can't be taught in Canada. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's an Australian based course um, that it's evidence-based. It's, it's, there's a lot of copycat courses. It's, and I've done many of them. It's by far the best. I mean, it's not even open for debate. And, but anyways, I was determined to bring it to Israel. So I went to Australia and said, told them like, hey, I, um, you know, I turned to them and basically fought with them for a year. I want to bring this. They said, well, who are you? And I said, well, you know, this is my background. You're Joe said, I, th We've got you, you're learning. Um, so they, they basically said, well, we, can, we only work with organizations. I said, okay, we set up an organization. 
mental health first aid Israel, you know, it's real original. And they ultimately gave in. And today we've trained over a thousand people in Israel. Um, we actually have what's called youth mental health first aid, standard mental health first aid, mental health first aid in the workplace. Nice. Um, so, you know, so that's one of the things that I've done. Another one is a project called Deconstructing Stigma, um, which, I, which actually is a project with McLean Hospital. Um, it happened on one of my trips out of Boston. I'm walking the halls. I, I mean, I'm a Fitbit fanatic, so I need my steps, especially before getting on a plane. And so I was just walking between terminals and I run across this exhibit and it's like fascinating. It's talking about mental health and it's just normal, normal people just sharing their story. So I'm snapping, there's 40 posters or so. I'm snapping each, I'm sending them to the family group. And I say, this, this is this the coolest thing? And then I look closer, it's McLean Hospital that put this out. So I contact the, it's run by the, I don't know, president's office or whatever there, I contact them, set up a meeting for, I was I was coming back the following week to Boston. Then I said, hey, would you guys be interested in bringing this to Israel? And they said, sure. Now, I said, that doesn't usually happen when you ask someone a question like that. And you know, it's tens of thousands of dollars of a project. And they say, sure, right away. Anyways, um, yes, I think COVID got in the way, but <laughs> we circumvented that. And actually this past November, we opened the first exhibit of Deconstructing Stigma in Israel. Um, you can look at it on the web. It's called deconstructingstigma.org backslash Israel. Um, and uh, it's just people. We managed to bring people from all walks of life in Israel, from the Orthodox community, the Haredi community, the Belz community, the Arab community, the secular community, um, because mental health doesn't doesn't distinguish. Right. Um, I like to say it doesn't matter if you're wearing a baseball cap, a bak cap, a brown cap, a shaitol, a strimal. It doesn't really matter. Right. It affects everyone the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually work very closely with Machon Lev and with Sharet Tzedek. Um, and it's it's on it's in four different places now in Israel and it's expanding in the rest of the country as well. Wow, so, amazing what you've been doing. So yeah, so um, and um, yeah, and a few other projects. And, That's and, fantastic. And you go around and speak. And I go around <laughs> and speak, yeah. Yeah. Whoever wants to listen. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me ask you a little bit more about suicidality and maybe also a little bit more about your daughter's story. Were there points before the suicide attempt where maybe you could have picked up that that would have happened? Sure. Like signs there, and... There's all kinds of signs yeah. and symptoms that mm -hmm. we had no idea about. And if, if someone had said them to us, we would have been in denial. For the simple uh. word is that suicide doesn't really exist. Um, it's, you know, people are really sick if they're sui suicidal. Um, because we're afraid to use the word suicide. Um, you know, in when I teach mental health first aid, whether in the States or in Israel, um, one of the one of the activities, um, if I'm not allowed to say, it's probably the one I enjoy the most even, uh, which is kind of morbid, but it's where you turn to your neighbor and you say, are you thinking about suicide? And I say, please don't answer the question, but I want you to ask the question. Are you thinking about suicide? Have you ever thought about suicide? And if they were to say yes, you don't have to be alarmed. You ask them if they have a plan because millions and millions of people in the United States alone every year think of suicide. And you know what? It's okay. There's nothing wrong with thinking about suicide. Better yet, there's nothing wrong with having a plan. What is wrong is if you plan to take, take, plan to take action on the plan. And that's where we have to stop it. But it starts by asking someone if they're thinking about suicide and not to be afraid to ask the question. Because if we ask the question, it, people it's a myth. People think you're putting yeah. something in their head. It's quite the opposite. Yes. You're actually allowing them to share something that's in their head and they don't know who to turn to and how to deal with it. So they're able to actually share. And it's a big relief for someone when you ask them and they can answer honestly. Um, part of it is, is who asks them. Um, if they feel they're gonna hurt the parent, um, they may not answer honestly. And it's real important that the parent or a caregiver or a Rebbe or whoever it is really have the genuine interest and let the person know 
um, whether it's a child or an adult, that they're not judging them by their answer. They're here to help them. Um, I've heard all kinds of statistics on that 50% of the given population at any point has a mental illness or living with a mental illness. Um, I've heard 90% of people in their lifetime are going to have some kind of mental illness and many don't even know about it. Or if they know about it, don't admit it because, because of stigma, because they're afraid, they're, they're afraid of how they're going to be viewed. And, um, those days are done. Right. Um, they have to be done. Um, I say mental health has to be talked about in the schools from the first grade and up. It's no less important than math or science mm -hmm. or Gamora. It's, mm -hmm. It's just as important. Right, so I, I want to ask Yoni if you thought that, did you think that if you ask someone, have you thought of suicide, that that would put the idea in their head? Have you thought, did you think that? Have I thought, if I asked the question, would it would it increase the likelihood basically yeah. of them yes. acting on it? I guess it will depend on when I ask the question, right? If I thought a person- I mean, at any point, let's say you, you ask anyone. Yeah, I would think, yes, and the answer is yes. If I thought right. it was like early on, it might be something they would consider that they may not have considered before, but maybe later on, if it was more noticeable, like the depression symptoms were more noticeable, then I would not think that way. But if I was having a conversation with someone who had no uh, outward, um, Symptoms signs. and I would signs and I, I would be very concerned to bring that up because I would be like, you know, inception putting it in their brain. You know, I wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. No. So then that, right, that's what yes. I wanted to know. Just because yeah. I think most people you would ask would say that would say they're scared to bring it up and that it's going to put ideas in someone's head. Right. Suicide is right. a the word itself is a difficult word to utter if you've never uttered it before. Um, that's why we, we, we practice asking the question. Um, because it's a very, if, I mean, today it rolls off my tongue every other word, but the first time I had it, I mean, when I got that phone call, it was she swallowed pills. It wasn't she made a suicide attempt. And I couldn't say the word suicide right away. Um, it took me a long time. And that's, that's not okay. I wanted to say it's okay. It's not okay. Um, we have to learn how right. to say it the same way we say cancer, which a couple of generations ago right. no people didn't say it was the big C. Right. Um, you know, but yeah. but suicide is the same, and it's definitely more common than cancer. Um, but it's more it, common than cancer. It's more common than cancer. It's more common than cancer. It's the attempts second, you mean, or even suicide. Death. Suicide. Death by suicide is the second leading cause mm -hmm. in the population um, between ten. And 34, it, although that number is increasing, and the 10 is going lower. Uh, like I work, I work the crisis text line, and um, we get calls from kids as young as five that are having suicidal thoughts. Um, but certainly the eight to 10 year olds, it's it's in there, and it and it goes up. It goes up to the geriatric mm -hmm. population. Right. So could we talk a little bit more about thoughts or ideation versus having a plan versus sure. actually attempting? So suicide, what's called suicidal ideation. There's two kinds of suicidal ideation. There's passive ideation, which are really, as you say, just mm -hmm. having the thoughts. And again, I can't emphasize enough that that's okay. It's okay to have the thoughts. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with you. You might be having a mental challenge that you're dealing with. You might have you might have depression. Um, and when I say a person's not their disease, so I don't say you have depression, you're living with depression. This, it's Living with depression is no different than living with asthma or living with diabetes or living with things that we know how to live with. Living with depression is possible. Um, there's a lot of coping mechanisms. Um, there's medication. Um, I'm not a medication pusher, so you probably will not hear me talk positively about it. Um, but, but medication can do wonders. Um, but therapy, the coping mechanisms are also incredible. And I say there's a third piece to that trilogy that is often ignored um, by the medical professionals, and that's family and community. Mm -hmm. Social um, support. Social yeah. support. The family, family and community. And, um, you know, there is no community like the Jewish community. Um, but when it comes to mental illness, there is no community like the Jewish community. We're about as far removed from it as possible. <laughs> 
And, um, and I, you know, people say, what do you mean? Of course I'm there for them. Um, we have incredible friends. When we told them our story, they said, let me know if there's anything I can do. And for most of them, that was the last we heard of them until she started coming out with her story. And then she's so brave, she's so this, and you guys are amazing. No, we're not amazing, we're real, we're human. And the Jewish community in general, I go around and, and I, it's, not, it's not to be critical, it's to be real, but how many people on the Mishnah Bebek list that goes around are, lit, are there because of a mental illness? How many Great Tehillim point. groups, how many Tehillim groups are there that have people that they say Tehillim for, for people living with a mental illness? Probably not because it'd be a lot longer. Um, You're saying, oh, well, they're all right, interesting. And this is where the community, how many people do you know so with that, a mental so illness that's, that you bring? So that's the stigma, okay. that's the, so it's, it's people are, are uncomfortable, they don't know what to say or what to exactly. do. Exactly, all of the above. Yeah. It's all what are the some above. of the what are some of the symptoms that right? Uh, I guess going back, going back to the signs, yeah. right? So if someone has someone in their life, but can I ask one who, question would they before, look for? before we go yeah. down this? Because I know okay. it's going to be the symptoms, then it's do, you, the training. Just, do you understand the difference between signs and symptoms? And then we'll answer the question. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so signs are things that you can see. Symptoms are things that are felt. So you're not going to see symptoms. Symptoms could symptoms. be reported to you. Right. Signs would be something you saw observable. Mm -hmm. But go ahead and ask the question. I just <laughs> wanted to. It's, uh, it's, no, it's good. The terms, I, I happen to not have known that. Um, but would you classify someone who thinks about killing others as the same group as someone who is suicidal? No, not at all. Suicide of individuals, certainly either passively or actively. And actively basically, just to clarify, actively means having a plan and having usually having a date to implement the plan. Um, um, the most common date is someone's birthday. That's the most common date that people plan. So if their birthday, you know, we're in June now, um, if their birthday's in October, you don't have to be overly concerned. You have to be concerned, but not, it's not like panic, let's get everyone into gear. Um, if their birthday's in June, you do wanna be more concerned. So there's the passive and the active. Um, but it's, it's, it's not being afraid to talk about it, not being afraid to deal with it. You know, that's with ideation. Ideation, I hate to use the word normal, I just, I don't like the word normal, but um, ideation, it's its part of life. Suicidal ideation is just... What about the argument that if you talk about something too much, you make it more normal? It's a more common... So I, I hear that. Um, I like we, we, we talk about cancer a lot. Because cancer you can't catch. Of course you can catch it. Well, I mean, is you can't catch it based on a, as a, by talking about it. Meaning you can't, it won't increase the likelihood of, in, meaning is there a, co not a causation or correlation between increased talking about something and it, and it's eventual happening by this particular field for cancer there is for no. sure not. The research right? doesn't show that. Yeah, the, the research, research doesn't show that. It shows the opposite. It shows the opposite. Yeah. Cause you, you could think, like there are like challenges right. on TikTok. You're going back to the myth. I'm still in the myth. myth. Okay. I'm still no, in the it's myth. important to cover good, that, right. it's important. Yeah. Right, so like let's say on TikTok, right? There are folks who like their challenges and there are stuff that, that people do and mm -hmm. then people are like they do st things based on like, cause everyone's doing it, right? Like, so if you, right. so I remember there was not, a show that that's someone- something else. That's, so that's not, not suicide. Right. No, but there was a show that-, that, that, that The that, 13 Reasons Why Something show? like that. And yeah. then basically it was like a big thing that, that if people will copy right. that girl. There so, is copycat right? suicide. There is copycat suicide. Yeah. So why is that, why is there copycat suicide but not copycat thinking? Like, if I know that well, you're thinking about it- it depends how you're talking about it. Are you talking about it to provide support? Right. Or, the truth, right. the mo usually when there's copycat suicide, um, it's, it's usually in the high school or early college years, and it's really because they don't know where to turn to. Um, and their friend convinces them, hey, I'm gonna do this, you can do it too. If they knew where to turn to, you know, if they felt someone comfortable they could turn to, they wouldn't be copycatting because they know better than that. It's also the same thing, what's called NSSI, which is non-suicidal self-injury. and it's, they don't want to die, but the pain to stay alive is too great. So that's when you deal with cutting and burning and, you know, a kid will go sit on, not necessarily a kid, it's adults too, will go sit on, an, on, the, on the window ledge um, and, and you think they're looking for attention. They're not look, looking for attention. They just don't, they can't deal with the emotional, the mental pain and anguish. So for that reason, they're going out and they're just trying to relieve themselves of the pain. Um, they don't want to jump but they also don't mind if they fall over. 
um, because the pain's so great. And it's just like, okay, whatever happens, happens. It's in God's hands, you can say. Um, but they really want to stay alive. Um, most people, most suicide, most people that make an attempt, and even though they, make, may, they may make multiple attempts, they don't want to die. They just can't bear the pain to stay alive. And, you know, it's the common, the common line is it's suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And um, and it's real. So you're saying it doesn't. You're saying it it won't it won't increase the likelihood because my talk because my question was that sh it won't. Why isn't it like copycat? And you're saying copycat is different because copycat is when you don't have enough education versus if you talk yeah, about yeah, it in a certain yeah. way, then it increase it will decrease the likelihood because there's more education around the topic. Right. Okay. Well, the way it's spoken about is going to make a difference. So watching these kinds of shows where suicide is more glorified yeah glorified or made into more entertainment is that very different be. than speaking about it from a mental health you know let's support everyone mm -hmm. kind of perspective it's two different Got completely so different you, things so when you heard about this or the tiktok videos right so just to go back to that there are for sure. people on tiktok who are showing these kinds of behaviors and like doing it in a way where they're encouraging others to right. copy them. And that's terrible. That's a terrible thing. Right. But it's not but what the, he's the, referring to. The person that's copying them is not, it's not someone that wants to die by suicide. Mm -hmm. They want to copy. Um, and if they show them, if they show them how to make cholent and they wanted to make cholent, they would copy mm -hmm. them. Um, it's not someone that, that's in such pain. Right. We'll be right back to this week's episode. Stort has so many great, great ways to help and connect with people who are going through the hardest time in their life. But first, we want to tell you about our friends at Relief. Relief is essentially an incredible free hotline that you could call if you are dealing with some form of mental health challenge or issue that you're going through or something in life that calls on the need for a psychologist or psychiatrist and you don't really know psychologists and psychiatrists which is normal you could call relief you could explain who you are what you're looking for and they have trained professionals to help sort and find you the best psychologist for you and it's free obviously once you get to the psychologist at that point there's you know the system that you're going to go and pay your psychologist. But to find the right one for you, it's essentially a free shotgun for you to help you live a happier and better life. You could call our friends at Relief at 718-431-9501. You could send them an email at info at reliefhelp.org, or you could go on their website, reliefhelp.org. Relief is just a phone call, an email, or a website away. They want to help you. They're great. And uh, their service is very needed in Claudia Soul at this point. And I was talking to Rabbi Abad the other day, and he was saying how it's not slowing down, unfortunately, but they're there to help you, someone in need. Go ahead and give them a call. Now back to this week's episode. Okay, so we're back to the signs and the symptoms. So let's just jump into that. Sure. Um, so let's focus on the signs because it's something that you want to see the person right um staying in their room a lot not wanting to get out someone that was very social all of a sudden they become more withdrawn um that's a that's a pretty clear sign um that's something's wrong again you don't want to panic um you want to but you want to you want to pay attention and you don't want to be afraid to ask you you want to ask them straight out are you thinking about suicide what happens if the answer is yes? That's no. amazing. Right. Amazing if the answer is yes. It means they're telling you the truth. And then what do you do? So the next question <laughs> is, do you have a plan? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, what's the plan? I plan to take the gun out of your closet and use it. Mm -hmm. Now what should you do, Jan? Well, then I would be like, and here's my wife. <laughs> go to mommy no but let's say right what would you do what should you do just the obvious next step are you asking are you serious yeah i'm serious what's the obvious next step if someone so they're hand, gonna take the gun like, hand me the gun no wait, it's my gun yeah yeah oh, okay. it's in your closet what do you do i honestly i don't know you get rid of the gun you oh that's <laughs> so 
Yes, you get rid <laughs> she of doesn't want me to get a gun. Okay. This is just for the record. <laughs> I happen to be anti-gun, but we're not going to go there. Um, uh, well, for something like this, right? I mean, you want to limit access to so whatever. You wanna, you want to limit the access, but again, is. someone that the 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 at this point, you know that the individual is in tremendous pain, tremendous pain, and you want to try to help them, and you don't want to be judgmental. Um, there's something that's called listening non-judgmentally, and you have to recognize they're in tremendous pain and they're not here to cause you the pain. Um, but you want to, you want to recognize the pain. You want to validate their pain. And, and it takes time to learn how you're looking at me like, there's no way I can do this. Um, there is, it takes time. It takes practice. And, um, you want to find that they have access to the means, mm -hmm. which if you're getting rid of the gun, they don't, but there are other means there's, bridges all over they could mm. go jump off a bridge they could hang themselves there's all kinds of ways i mean they could google the ways they know the better than you do um and uh but you want to find out their time frame when do they plan to do this so you with your hotline you'll get on a phone and this is how the conversation goes this is how the mm -hmm. conversation goes mm -hmm. very simple straightforward there's no secrets um we're not here to judge so like when do you plan on doing it and they say tomorrow so then we try to we try to we try to do whatever we can um, to stop it. Um, by the way, it's not always we're not always able to. Not does it drive able. you crazy? It's upsetting, um, but you you do everything you possibly can. The same way, I'll go back to the cancer example. Do you do chemo? Do you not do chemo? It's going to cause a lot of damage. Are we able to save everyone that we? provide treatments for cancer? No, we're not. It's recognizing that someone with suicidal ideation, we're not able to save them all, but we're able to do a better job than we've been doing. That we do now. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts by talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is definitely a very serious conversation that needs to be spoken about. Right, right. it has to be spoken about um, in the Jewish community, um, in all circles. Um, from the schools to the schools to neighbors. Um, and that's, you know, again. So one of the signs you see is seeing someone in their room. Withdrawing. Right. Withdrawing. Any right. kind of major behavior change. Any major behavior change. Right. Any would be right. A sign. Again, right. you know, I, I joked about showering before. Someone who normally would take a lot of showers all of a sudden just isn't taking a shower. Some of them would put on makeup. All of a sudden they're not doing any makeup anymore. They really don't care what they look like. Um, giving stuff away is a sign. Mm -hmm. um, Again, we got to clean up every so often and come Pesach, you know, we give stuff away. But um, if someone's doing a little more, um, that's a sign. That said, um, you know, if someone's planning a big vacation and you feel like, hey, they're getting better, they're planning this big vacation, we're going on it, they're better, um, that's, that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, they kind of, they want to get better, but that doesn't mean that they're better. Uh, mental illness is chronic. Um, we have to learn how to live with it um, for the rest of our lives. Um, and, and it's possible. It's very possible. Um, I'd say it's more possible when the community and the family comes behind it. Um, I've seen many cases where families are not behind. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've visited over 200 residential facilities, and I've seen families that are so behind the patient, their loved one, that that patient has a tremendous chance of survival. And I've seen the exact opposite where people with a lot of money just write the check, but they don't really care about that. When I say they don't care, they don't- They don't can't get there. They don't show the love, um, the emotional love, um, you know, not the physical love by writing the check, but the emotional love. Um, those patients struggle a lot more and sometimes don't make it. What would you tell family members, friends to do in the case of where there is no plan it's not really active. They're not going into a, mm -hmm. a treatment program, but there's ideation and the person's thinking about it a lot and they're in a lot of distress. Maybe they're in therapy once a week or whatever it is. What are some things that the family can do to be supportive? So the first thing to the family, I would say self-care of yourself. Um, I told them in the travel business, the days before COVID, they used to say, put your oxygen mask on. Today they say, take your mask off. but. Um, <laughs> Um, used to be put your oxygen mask on yourself first before you. Right. Okay. So it's the same thing with, with um, a yeah, family member. And it, 
mental illness affects every family, right. okay? There, there is no family immune. There's no vaccine. There's no booster. There's nothing. Um, it affects every family. Whether we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, it's in every family. I've yet to meet a family that's honest with themselves. They don't have to be honest with me, mm -hmm. but honest with themselves that's not affected by mental illness. So the first thing is to, to, take, to have a plan to take care of yourself because you can't help someone else unless you take care of yourself, you know? Um, I grew up in B'nai Akiva, and uh, Rabbi Akiva always said, we have to kamocha. So I focus on the word kamocha. We all know we have to lerecha. We got to treat everyone. We have to be or lagoyim, this, that, and the next thing. But we forget the word kamocha. And unless we take care of ourselves, and I say this to remind myself all the time because I do a horrible job of it, unless, unless we take care of ourselves, we can't take care of others. So that's the first thing I would tell the family, which is probably not what you were expecting. Um, your loved one, the one really suffering, sees that. And they see what you're going through. Just yesterday, someone asked me, um, we were dealing with a child, and, I, and they asked me what they should do. I said, the first thing is your child should see you in therapy. They should see you in therapy because they're, they know it's okay to go. Most children today want to go to, when I was growing up, if you, if you went to therapy, you were nuts. Today, if you're not in therapy, you're nuts. But, you know, it's, but it's, but children, if they see their parents, um, uh, in in therapy or, or whatever, they they gain a lot of respect, um, and it's it's because it's it's part of the norm, right. and um, it's a plug for therapists. Um, <laughs> right? No, but you're simply you're just modeling for them what it means to access support. Kids. That's right. it, and then right. you want them to right. do the same. The other thing is um, in a community, I say, and I and I repeat this mishabera of the hill almost and meal trains. If there's a family member that's suffering, bring them a meal. We do it when there's cancer. We do it with other illnesses. Mental illness should, should be different. When you say mental illness, do you mean specifically someone struggling with suicidality or you mean like- For today, I'll say suicidality because that's what we're focusing yeah. on, but I mean any mental illness. Some, some kid has ADHD, meal train. Um, if it's gonna help the parents, absolutely. It depend, depends how severe it is, definitely. Um, again, you, you want you want a nice balance because you don't want people don't want to be accepting forever because I said it's chronic, it's gonna be the whole life, so you don't want to necessarily do it. But 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 they should know that they if they need something mm -hmm. they can turn to you and not be embarrassed as a neighbor. Right. Know, because today mm -hmm. we're embarrassed to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So so back to the what would you tell the family? So let's say the kid is going to the parents and saying I'm having suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, Let's what talk the, about how it. does the parent respond? So the parent would want to talk about it. Um, want to assure the kid that it's it's perfectly okay and they understand that. They don't want to tell them about when they were a kid, if they had suicidal <laughs> thoughts. I mean, it's not like the, the focus has to be on the one sharing their story, not on you when you were a teenager, um, because we do that a lot. Um, and the focus has to be on, on listening to the kid and validating them. Um, and if the kid says, I just can't, you know, I, I know schools don't like me saying this, but I'm going to say it anyways. If the kid can't be in school, the kid should be at home. Um, you know, help them with, let them, let them come back to school when they're ready. Um, so they're not going to ace, ace school. You know what? They, Who cares? By, by not acing school, they may ace life. Right. Because if they die, they're not going right. to ace school either. Right. And, and this is where school, I was at a school uh, about a, uh, last month, actually, I, um, they asked me what they should do. And I said, I, I'm challenging you. They're taking me up on it, actually. Um, you asked what I've done. This is another thing. Right. Um, is I, I said to them, I want you next year, 23, 24, to give every teacher, teacher and student in the school a mental wellness day. And the only thing you want to ask from them is to schedule it. And they have to come in the next day and say how they spent it. I it's love not, that. It's not a sick day. It's not, you know, and the ones who may not like it are parents because if the kids are young and can't be home alone. I said, parents should take a wellness day too. And if their employer is going to dock them, so be it. But I want the school to pay the teachers and to not allow, make every kid take a mental wellness day. I asked for five. I got one. But <laughs> I was say one sounds reasonable. <laughs> right. Okay. It's a start. Um, but yeah, so I, I, what else can we do? Um, initiatives like that, um, because what that does more than anything, it's not only the kid taking a teacher taking a day off, it's opening the conversation. 
I mean, it's furthering the conversation along, which is what we, which is the immediate, which is the immediate need. Right. Can I ask you a question about um, suicidality and suicide when it comes to time over like the last two hundred years? Are we are, are this would the the arguments you're making assumes that the the rate of suicides stayed the same, right? So or or at least stay the same, but or or in, or just say, but, but if they're increasing over time, then. And there's obviously more mental health awareness over time. So what what's what's happening? Meaning, like a hundred years ago, there was no mental health awareness, and suicide suicide rates were probably in the single digits. Now there's significantly more mental health awareness than a hundred years ago, right? Like my grandfather, like he didn't have he there was no like he was in he served in World War II in the U.S. Army. There was no like there's not a chance that that he had you know went to a therapist, right? Or my grand, like his parents is not even, right? And suicide rates were for sure seriously low. So we have more mental health now. I mean, even though you're right, we're, we could do better, but we ha- we definitely have more mental health now, but suicide rates are still up. So how do we work with that? Data? So first of all, suicide rates are up. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not sure. I don't, probably have some studies. I'm not familiar with them. I think suicide rates are up because we have better statistics today. Um, and I, I know so in Israel that many people that die by suicide today, it's not reported as suicide. You mean to, even today? Even today. So we What's don't it reported as in Israel? Accidental death. Um, part of that has to do with the Rabbi Nud, part of it has to do with the police, the, the families, the tremendous stigma. I can tell you two suicides I've heard about last week that they're not being reported as suicide. What, what were the? Um, I'm not going to get into it. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's it's and and it's in other countries around the world as well. Um, in many of the Southeast Asian and African countries, um, if you have a mental illness, you basically go to jail. Um, you're tied up. Um, so if you manage to die, it's not it's not reported as suicide. Mm-hmm. So the fact that suicide rates are going up is we have better reporting today. Um, okay. Are they are they going up in general? I don't know, but I know one factor is the better reporting and being more honest about it. Um, suicide is a cause of death um, and language matters. I mean, um, when talking about suicide, I, I hate the expression committed suicide. We commit sins. We don't commit suicide. I say you can commit suicide if you commit cancer. People, suicide is a cause of death. You can argue it with me. No, I'm, looking just at thinking, me like, I'm just thinking. I'm processing it. Yeah, it's um, but it's it's we we do we because do, I think the Torah does say that it might be. I think right. I think sometimes we misinterpret what the Torah means, okay, and, rather than what it says. And I'm not a rabbi, so <laughs> Neither go <am> ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, um, you know, again, decades ago, people that died by suicide were buried at the corner of the cemetery or out of the cemetery. Today, I know very, very mm-hmm. few rabbis that even will dream of that. And that's because it's recognized it's someone dies. Mm-hmm. They die. They die of a mental illness. I mean, um, it's, not, it's not the right? same. And I think part of it is that a great part of it is, and hope a message that we can get through on this, mm-hmm. is that if the community becomes more involved and in accepting that mental illness is real and suicidality is real, ideation is real, that... We can we can play a greater role as a community, um, in in helping people learn coping mechanisms and keeping them alive. So, what are those things? What are some of the coping mechanisms? Well, there's all kinds of therapy, um, and I'm not going to go into different modalities. It's, you know, so you um, would immediately tell someone who has those thoughts, you got to go to therapy. There's no, you have to. I'm recommending that you go. Okay. Okay. And and it's a challenge because finding a good therapist for you is challenging. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean the therapist is a bad therapist. It means they're not a good therapist for you at that time. Got okay. right. A good um, shidduch. It's a good mm-hmm. a good shidduch at that time. A good therapist that you had last year may not be a good therapist today. And you had a horrible experience with a the therapist last year. That therapist may be phenomenal today. Um, it just it it's yes, sir, mm-hmm. you've, you've seen a, a lot of different matches. And- oh my God! Yeah. All, all the time, Fascinating. and and it's and it's important to find, and it's important to know that if, if it's not a match, and often the first one is not a match, or the second one, it's that there's hope, 
And as a family member or as a friend in the community, I'm going to be with you. We're going to, we're going to do this together. You can never say it's going to be okay because you don't know if it's going to be okay. You see, so you can't say it's going to be okay, it's but you can say, I'm going to be here with you. Um, obviously, if you say it, you better mean it. Um, but right, that's, word, that could be really. Yeah. Although uh, often people with mental illness have trust issues. I think we all do. Um, and um, by saying you're going to be there and not be there, that's, that's, that's a big, that's a big, it's a big no, no, as they say. Wow. Yeah. But so therapy, are there any like immediate, someone like someone, <clears throat> I got on the phone with someone and they, you know, I broached this topic and they, they open up about this. The best thing I say is let's, I mean, I, what I enjoy doing, again, it goes back to my steps, but I say, let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. First of all, it's nothing like fresh air. Um, but but let's go for a walk. Um, can we go into the gym with someone? Um, and you don't have to, you don't have to, but, uh, nonverbal communication is excellent. You don't have to necessarily speak with them about their thoughts. If they want to share, they'll share. Just being with them and letting them know you care, letting them know you care, by being with them, you're letting them know you care. Mm -hmm. And that's gold. Um, you know, coping with mental illness, um, and this I've learned the hard way, and it's taken me a long time. I'm a type A personality, got to have all the ducks in order, let's get them done, one, two, three, as fast as we can, you know? I mean, I'm the, I'm the one that if, if I can take two tile and I want to take four, I'll get better faster. Um, and mental health doesn't work that way. And you said it doesn't work. It though. does not work that way. The slow route is the slow route is the fast route. Um, it's taken me a long time to learn. I'm still learning, um, because I still try to fight the system, but the slow route is the fast route. Um, there are no shortcuts. There are no yeah. shortcuts. No, there are not. I haven't found them yet. <laughs> <laughs> are there any? Like you were saying some no-nos, any specific things like not to do or not to say? Well, do not say it's going to be okay. Right. Okay. Um, it's also okay, by the way, if it, you don't feel like you can help at a certain time, say, listen, I can't, I just can't do this right now. Uh, right before we started the podcast, I got a text from someone in crisis. I said, I can't talk to you right now. Call the crisis line. Wow. Uh, and I'll talk to you afterwards. Okay, it's like, yeah. so let, let's talk about that. Because this is something that I deal a lot with teenagers about where they feel responsible to, let's say to take a call or go out with a friend, whatever it is at a time that's very inconvenient for them, or could even mm -hmm. be like harmful to them, because they need to be doing something else. Mm -hmm. um, and they really feel that it's their responsibility to do that. And I try to tell them, no, it's not. Yeah, um, I look, I, I, I fight. I fight with that every day. Yeah. yeah like I want to help everyone. Um, but I also know that if I don't take care of myself, I can't help anyone. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be able to help everyone. And it's painful. Right. It's very painful. Um, I almost told you, give me 10 minutes. I want to take this. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, because, uh, you know, we, we, we do what we can, but we're also human. Um, so the first thing is taking care of ourselves. Um, if you feel you can't help anyone else and you always have to take care of yourself, that's okay. But because you're not going to be able to help anyone if you don't take care of yourself. Um, the other thing not to do is don't dodge the questions. Um, you know, are you thinking about suicide? Um, and you don't want to water it down. Like, oh, I see you haven't been happy lately. Are you thinking of hurting yourself? Hurting yourself is not killing yourself, okay? And they can say, no, they're not thinking of hurting themselves because they're thinking of killing themselves um, because the pain is great. Um, and if they say no, you don't have to say, phew. Say, thank, you for, thank you for being honest with me um, because it lets them know that you're not afraid if they had said yes. What happens if somebody gets offended? Like I feel like if I would ask such a question, I could offend somebody. I'm just thinking about you know, a hypothetical conversation. And mm -hmm. I think I might offend someone with such a question. Like, why would you think that way about me? Or, I don't know, I feel like it could be, it's a very serious yeah. you conversation. You would be offended if someone asked me and that. What I don't if, know, it's like a very intense you, thing to... What if you didn't ask the question and two months later they died by suicide? 
Fair rebuttal. I think if it becomes more normal, it won't be seen as offensive. It'll just be seen as caring, right? But in a world where it's not a normal thing to ask, then maybe someone could get offended. But I think if they get offended, meaning if someone's like, oh, why would you think to ask me that? You just say, oh, because, you know, I was taught that this is how I'm supposed to ask. I'm supposed to show you that I care. Very happy to hear things are going well or you something. I mean? Like, I think to have you some kind of you, response answer, like that. Your answer that, because I care, right. Is enough of an answer. And if they come back and say, if you really cared, you wouldn't have asked, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever mm -hmm. asked anyone, Tar? Yeah, all the time. Really? Mm -hmm. Almost every day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I guess I I have not. I feel I I would feel uncomfortable. Because it takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense that way. And that's why asking right. the question should be started at a young age. Because if you asked someone when you were in first grade or second grade, you wouldn't be uncomfortable today. I feel so uncomfortable teaching my kid about this, though. Like, I would feel like super uncomfortable talking to my kid about this. In what sense? I don't know. I just, I, I cannot, like... You would feel comfortable talking to our kid about this? Yeah. But the kids the kids have heard the word suicide before. Most kids have. Or okay, they, so obviously it's, 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 no, or, or they, know, or I'm they obviously learn learning. It, no, or they learn it even in like Chumash and like they, meaning they learn it in school. Not even that they've heard about it like through other means, but they, they hear about it through Torah. Mm -hmm. Like they, they know that it's a concept. So Mental they know it's a concept. Goes why? Way why should before we, not? we were born. So right. All throughout the Torah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I got some. I got some homework to do. <laughs> it's a good thing we had this conversation, though. Right. Um, so we went through the signs, symptoms. Remember that we don't know that that's explained. Um, then it's discussing you know, how, like the methods of how someone might go about it. And then some of the, the tools to, you know, you said, take a, you know, speak with someone pretty often or, you know, just, and then therapy, that's what we're holding. On your crisis hotline, do you write safety plans with? Yeah, so Could again, talk about safety plans? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, safety plans are basically when you're having um, active ideation, um, it's generally with active, it doesn't, you could use it with passive, but, um, active ideation, who do you call, what do you do? Um, and if you're in therapy, there's a lot of therapeutic modalities. Some people will just have watching YouTube on, um, you know, with animals or with waves, um, and that helps them relax or calm down. Some people will go to the gym, some will go for a walk, but it's being able to access your, as I say, your toolkit and being able to use it at a time. The problem is when someone is in crisis, they're not always able to access their tools. Um, which is why you have a friend or a few friends that you can call. I always say is have a safety WhatsApp group and just say, I need help. And then it goes to 10 people at once and they decide who's going to reach out or whatever, because that way you hope that if 10 people are in the group, one's going to be available. Oh, that's a very good idea. Right. Um, so that's what I usually suggest to people. That's a very solid idea. Um, you know, in today's world, but safety plans can be a simple, you know, I, I say sometimes people develop safety plans and they make them very complex. And then it's hard for the person to remember what they're going to do. I say, you just need a couple of tools and, you know, you reach out to one person who knows to reach out to someone else that can help you at that mm -hmm. time. Um, and even if, if, even if they say to you, listen, I can't talk right now, I'll call you back in 10 minutes and 15 minutes and an hour, it helps you relax because you know that they're going to get back to you. You know, they heard you. If they don't get back to you, it's a different story. But you know, and but usually when someone's involved in a safety plan, they will get back to you. And it's okay to say, I can't talk right now. Um, wow. Well, you could find templates online, like empty blank ones that can be filled out. And you can, right. And you can also create your own, though. Yeah, right. Do people come back to you after, um, you know, they, they've worked with you in the program and, they, you know, they say, like, I can't believe I was there and now look where I am now and, like, like those, like, how does that feel to? So the answer to your question, yes. 
They do. Um, you know, I get a lot of calls, um, specifically, mainly from parents. Like, what do I do with my kid? And my conversation always starts, you know, I'm not a professional. They say, yes, but I was told to call you. And it's a little upsetting um, because they're afraid to go to professionals many times because sadly I've met many professionals that are afraid of the word suicide as well. And it's upsetting. Um, so it's a good feeling. Um, you know, it's a good feeling able to talk to someone and it's usually one more person that I know is gonna be an ambassador for talking about suicide in the world. And um, if that's the way the conversation has to progress, and so be it. Um, but it's 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 recognizing that it's 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 okay to talk about it. It's healthy to talk about it, and the conversation has to keep going. Um, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop when okay, I made an attempt. I'm done. Um, my mom always asks about my daughter. Is she better now? Well, she's in a better place today than she was five years ago. She's cured, she's okay. She's in a better place than she was five years ago, but she has a chronic illness. And, you know. It's awesome that you're, you know, she's, she allows you to talk about her story. Gives a lot of physics to a lot of people. Yeah, she's, she's amazing. She's truly amazing. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on and My sharing pleasure. with us and giving us your perspective a little different than what we usually get. So yeah, we wow. really appreciate it. Hope it moves the conversation on. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Very powerful. And we want to put out the most powerful episodes possible. So if you have an idea for someone who should come on, that's an issue. Go ahead and go to livinglechaim.com slash suggest and tell us who you want to hear from. Tell us the subjects, the topics, the issues that are happening that you want us to shed light on to try to, we're not really solving anything here with this podcast. And I think all podcasts think the biggest mistake podcasts make is they think they're going to solve something. We're not solving anything. We're just having a conversation to help open doors, to help you think about something that maybe you don't know much about or something that you've been dealing with that you don't really have access to really hear three people, two people here, have a conversation about it and just really open the doors to help you get the help you need or understand the challenge that someone in your community, your family, your friends are going through. If you have not yet rated us five stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, go ahead and rate us five stars, not two, not three, not four, but five stars. And if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and leave in the comments what the your favorite message from Stuart was. There were so many that I had, and we wanna hear from you. We wanna understand you as a viewer, what you gained from this episode. We know it's a lot, but what's your biggest takeaway from this episode? Go ahead and let us know in the notes on YouTube. Until next time, stay safe. Living L'chaim.